coming up on Bridge City News. More staff cuts coming to the University of Lethbridge. Plus, the city lays out its Phase 2 relaunch strategy. And, originally planned for Phase 3, gyms are now upgraded to Phase 2, but are they ready to reopen so soon? Your nation. Your province. Your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Hello, thank you for joining us. The University of Lethbridge is calling for more job cuts despite a reduction of 83 employees or 7% of their overall staff list since last November. In a memo sent to university faculty and staff, University President Mike Mann says the U of L needs to reduce their expenditure budget by $8.6 million during the current fiscal year. This means the U of L is in a worst case scenario, according to Mann. He says, quote, while we had hoped the substantial budget reduction steps taken in recent months had brought us within striking distance of a balanced budget for 2020-21, the reality is we face a significant budget challenge that will require further action. In the memo, Mann points out that more workers will have to be laid off, although he doesn't indicate when. We uh, reached out to the university today, but they did not respond to our request for an interview. The province announced an, ex an expedited relaunch of phase two, moving the date ahead of schedule from June 19th to June the 12th. According to the province, this stage will allow additional businesses and services to reopen and resume operations with two meter physical distancing requirements in place. Businesses and services include K to 12 schools for requested diploma exams and summer school, libraries, places of worship, additional scheduled surgeries, wellness services such as massage, acupuncture, and reflexology, personal services such as aesthetics like manicures, pedicures, waxing, facial treatments, and artificial tanning, movie theaters, fitness centers, pools, and arenas. For a complete list of all the amenities, please visit our website or our Facebook page. Tuesday's announcement of the early phase two relaunch came as a surprise to most Albertans, including the city. Even more surprising was that swimming pools were included, which means that they can open as early as this Friday. But will that realistically happen? BCN's Naveen Day gives us the answer. Much to many people's surprises, including the city's, many public facilities, including swimming pools, can reopen as early as this Friday. However, Lethbridge's General Manager of Recreation and Culture says it's not a matter of simply opening the doors just because they can. There's lots that we need to consider and, and put in place prior to that. So some of the things we have to consider is we need to recall some of our staff that, that we, we laid off when we were closed all our facilities. We need to train some of our staff on, on, uh, on the new cleaning procedures and, and, and the new, uh, new guidelines and restrictions. Um, those things, you know, putting hand sanitizer stations up, uh, marking facilities uh, for distancing requirements, etc. Uh, and then also uh, the big part of that is we have to look at refilling our pools, which are currently empty. We need to fire up the ice plants again and uh, we need to get, get ice made in those facilities. As new guidelines come into place for reopening, Director of Emergency Management Mark Rathwell says there are no specific reopening dates announced for city amenities. We don't have any uh, official timelines for when a lot of our structures will be reopened. We're again making sure we have our guidelines from the province and making sure that we can apply them all appropriately, safely for staff and for our customers. So as soon as we have all those pieces in place, we'll be able to give exact dates. The city remains under a state of local emergency. However, Rathwell adds that that could be lifted in as early as two weeks from now. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. Thank you, Naveen. If you've been stuck at home, there's a good chance you've been going a bit stir crazy without access to your local gym. Facilities like these originally planned for Alberta's phase three relaunch will be open as early as Friday. BCN's Ainsley O'Reilly visited some of these businesses to see if they'll be ready to jump back into things by the weekend. All gym facilities in the province are legally allowed to open their doors on Friday. The Corvan Ray YMCA in Lethbridge is a multi-use, multi-purpose building, meaning that there's a lot for them to think about before they can relaunch and welcome the public. Realistically, 
a July, an early July timeframe, I think would not be unreasonable for us to say. But again, we don't know all the conditions and changes and modifications that come to the restrictions. Communications Director Ross Jacobs says that the facility may open specific services individually, being mindful of provincial regulations. So we have to find a way to meet things like capacity limits that are uniform across the board. That's a big piece. You know, some areas are allowed to have more than others, but if they conflict, how do you move people through? On the north side of town, local Perfect Fit For You gym owners Rob and Ashlyn Gunderson are elated by the news that they can open Friday. Perfect Fit For You, along with many other independent gyms and locally owned businesses, we're very, very grateful to have our clients back in our gym, to have that face-to-face -face interaction, to create that community. The couple admits that keeping their distance might be a challenge. You're not going to have that interaction, you know, with the fist bumping and the high fiving. So, um, as like a personal trainer myself, it's going to be tough to kind of like keep that personal space because I get so excited when my clients are seeing success and they're and they're pushing themselves in the gym. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. And while the YMC is holding off on opening many of its services, summer day camps will be running this year. Communications Director Ross Jacobs says that there will be subtle changes to previous years. It may not be the camp programming you're used to. Social distancing requirements, health screens, reduced camp cohort sizes, and other safety precautions will be in place. I was hoping to provide registration dates for you today, however, the changes because of yesterday's announcements are very positive and give us more camp programming options we hadn't previously been able to offer. The result is that we require just a little bit more time to pivot and to change the camp structure so that we can open up more spaces and programming to both our paid and assisted families. Registration isn't open yet, but you can check their Facebook and website at lethbridgeymca.ca for details. With the announcement from the Alberta government yesterday that phase two of the COVID-19 relaunch is starting on June 12th, churches in Lethbridge are gearing up to welcome back their congregations. Doug Shimoda is the lead pastor at City Light Church, and he says that the church won't be reopening fully until June 28th, and that they are looking at different ways of worshiping. Worship is such a powerful part of our service, and we want people to worship and not, you know, miss out on that experience. So, but we realize we can't do it the way we did before. But we believe that, you know, we can still have worship to an extent where people maybe can't sing, actually sing loudly with their voices, but, you know, they can still clap their hands. They can raise their, their hands in praise to God. They can move with the music. So, and, you know, if they want to, they can also wear masks as well. So maybe they can't do it with their voice, but they can still sing in their spirit. Virtual reality is a simulated experience that can transport you to a new world and Control V Arcade in Lethbridge just reopened yesterday as Micah Quinn explains. The virtual reality arcade says that they're only opening half of their stations at the moment to maximize social distancing and make sure that they can sanitize the equipment after each use. Control V is a virtual reality arcade and they reopened their doors on June 9th they're finally ready to be able to bring back virtual reality to Lethbridge. Virtual reality um, is a 360-degree uh, uh, environment that is rendered by a computer. Uh, and it interacts with you on different points based on infrared lights. So you'll have a headset, and in that headset you have two uh, screens, one for each eye. Uh, and it'll basically tell you what you're looking at and tell the computer what to show you what you're looking at. Booth says that virtual reality is very conducive for social distancing. Each person has their own station uh, and everybody is walled in in their own space, right? It's been a struggle for Control-V having to be shut down during COVID-19. The only thing that we could do to survive was to take on more debt. Uh, and so financially, Looking at the rest of the year and looking at, you know, future payments that we have to make, uh, being open is, is extremely important uh, to us to be able to meet those uh, obligations and uh, stick around so we can keep offering VR to uh, Lethbridge. Virtual reality is also a great workout. We've got a fantastic game called Pistol Whip, uh, which is like John Wick, the video game, uh, where you're uh, going around and, and uh, basically squatting the whole time. Like, it can be a good workout. Control V is now open full time, and my legs are going to be hurting for the next week. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. 
Two fire stations responded to a blaze at a duplex building in South Lethbridge yesterday afternoon. According to the city, the fire started at one of the balconies of the building in the 3800 block of 20th Avenue South. The blaze was extinguished. There were no injuries reported and the total damages are estimated at $20,000. It was determined that improper extinguished smoking material was most likely the cause. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is comparing today's university graduates to the generation that came of age during the Second World War. The Prime Minister delivered a commencement address at Carleton University this morning that was carried live to graduates across the country whose own grad ceremonies have been affected by COVID-19. He talked about the sacrifices young people have to make to protect against COVID-19, their leadership in fighting climate change and their fight against racism, stressing the importance of unity in confronting these challenges. This day is nothing like you imagined it to be. And the world is a much different place than anyone could have predicted even a year ago. It's tough. You should be celebrating with your friends, taking pictures in your gowns, attending the ceremony on campus. Very few graduating classes and living memory will have faced a challenge of this magnitude. The federal parties are blaming each other for the delay and promised COVID-19 benefits for Canadians with disabilities after opposition parties refused to give unanimous consent to the Trudeau government's latest emergency aid bill. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh says the Liberals wouldn't negotiate on the stalled bill. We need a concrete commitment that the CRB will be extended for those families who have no other support. They have no way to go back to work. Their jobs and their workplaces are not reopening. They need to know that the CRB will be for them, will be there for them. Secondly, we've said that for Canadians living with disabilities, this is something we pushed the government to deliver on five weeks ago. And they said five weeks ago, we pushed them to bring in some supports for Canadians with disabilities without delay. Well, five weeks is a massive delay. There's been no help for Canadians with disabilities throughout this pandemic. We spoke with Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly about the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, and he says 200,000 ineligible people have received the benefit, costing the government $4 million per month. When you're talking 200,000 people getting this that shouldn't, uh, Jeanette, we're talking $400 million a month. So that's a lot of money. Now they're starting to say that they will crack down, and if you were getting this, you know, not because you thought you were eligible for it and you really weren't, but if you knew you were frauding the system, they're coming after you. They need help from the opposition parties to get that. They dismissed the Conservatives before. Now they're going to need the help of the Conservatives because the NDP has said, we don't want to go after anyone that got this money when they shouldn't have. You're wrong. We'll hear more about this CERB from Brian Lilly coming up in the second half of our show. A day after attending his brother's funeral, Philanese Floyd went to, the, went to Capitol Hill to challenge Congress to stop the pain. He doesn't want his brother George to be just another name on a growing list of those killed during interactions with police. Floyd choked back tears as he told politicians that he wants to make sure that his brother is, quote, more than another face on a T-shirt. He challenged members of the House Judiciary Committee to listen to the people marching in the streets enough is enough by the leaders that is our country the world needs the right thing the people elected you to speak for them to make positive change George's name means something you have the opportunity here today to make your names mean something too if his death end up changing the world for the better and I think it will then he died as he lived. It is on you to make sure his death is not in vain. We've been seeing a lot of sunshine this week, but it could get a bit wet right in time for the weekend. We'll have full weather details coming up right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Here is a look at our weather for this evening in the Lethbridge tonight. A few clouds. Uh, we're going to be having a light westerly wind at 30 K per hour at times. So it's going to be gusting to 50. The overnight low tonight, 10 degrees into tomorrow. A mix of sun and cloud. However, we could see a slight chance of showers tomorrow as well. 30% chance 
to be exact. 24 is the high tomorrow and then into tomorrow evening. 11 degrees is the overnight low. Not too bad at all. And then as we look further into the five day forecast, Friday, we're going to be seeing a chance of showers as well. But look at that temperature high of 29 degrees into Saturday, 25, but a 60% chance of showers on Saturday and Saturday evening. Sunday, lots of sunshine with a high of 16. 23 is the high for Monday and 22 for Tuesday with a mix of sun and cloud for both of those days. So as we're seeing those temperatures kind of rising and falling, we're seeing that the average is rising for this time of year. 22 degrees is the average high. The average low for this time of year, eight. The high temperature on this day was 34 degrees. It was back in 1956. And the lowest temperature was zero. That was in 1999. The sun woke up this morning at 524 AM and our evening sunset tonight, 938 PM. Uh, giving us about a one minute or so longer of daylight today than we had yesterday as we're slowly creeping towards that summer solstice coming up very shortly on June the 20th. Now, Victoria and Vancouver are going to be seeing some showers tomorrow, high of 17, 22 the high in Edmonton, 23 in Calgary, with a mix of sun and cloud across Alberta for much of tomorrow into as Saskatchewan, lots of sunshine there. Saskatoon's high 22, 24 in Regina. Winnipeg will see a high of 16 degrees. There is a possibility of a th thunderstorm tomorrow and some showers in Winnipeg. Now, as we move over into central Canada, uh, Toronto had a heat warning today, but tomorrow it should cool down quite a little bit. 21 degrees is the low, or the high rather, with a possibility of some showers. Periods of rain expected in Ottawa as well. 25 the high, 25 also expected in Montreal. So nice warm temperatures. And as we move into Atlantic Canada, 20 is the high for Fredericton. Possibility of some showers there. A mix of sun and cloud for both Halifax and Charlottetown. Highs of 21 and 20 in those regions. 13 is the high in St. John's, Newfoundland with a mix of sun and cloud for tomorrow. There you go, that is your weather. This year's peak tourist season is shaping up to be a bust for the $102 billion tourism industry. The tourism sector has already been decimated by a near total drop off in commercial and leisure travel, but hopes to salvage some business through regional trips and late summer events. That's despite reports the shutdown of the U.S. border for all but essential travel could be extended until late next month. Starbucks has announced plans to close up to 200 locations across Canada. It says some will be repositioned, which could mean that they would be moved to a new area or change format. The Seattle-based company also announced this morning that it has taken a COVID-19 related hit to its third quarter revenue of at least $3 billion. HBO Max has temporarily removed Gone with the Wind from its streaming library, calling the 1939 movie a product of its time that depicts racial prejudices. When it returns to the recently launched streaming services lineup, the movie will include historical context and a denouncement of its depictions of romanticized slavery in the Civil War era South. Gone with the Wind has long been denounced for featuring slave characters who remain loyal to their former owners after the abolition of slavery. It remains the highest grossing film of all time when adjusted for inflation. And now here is a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 132 points today to 15,701. The Dow was down 282 points to 26,989. The S&P 500 was down 17 points to 3,190. The Nasdaq was up 66 points to 10,020. Oil was up 14 cents to 39.08 per barrel. Natural gas was up 2 cents to $1.79. Gold was up 11 cents to 1738 an ounce. Silver was even on the day at 1811 an ounce. Wheat is at $245 per metric ton. Barley is at $244. Canola is at $469. Corn is at $230 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 28 cents to 97.75. Feeder cattle were down $1.58 to 134.75. Lean hogs were down 23 cents to 48.45. And the Canadian dollar was up slightly on the day to 74.57 US. 
Recapping our top story, the University of Lethbridge is calling for more job cuts despite a reduction of 83 employees since last November. In a memo sent to university faculty and staff, University President Mike Mann says the U of L needs to reduce their expenditure budget by $8.6 million during the current fiscal year and that more workers will have to be laid off. Coming up after the break, we talk with Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly about the Canadian Emergency Response B Benefit and the call for body cameras on police. That is coming up right after the break. Stay with us. Protests and riots have been making the headlines after a white police officer was captured on video with his knee on the neck of a black man, George Floyd. Now calls for body cameras and defunding of police are being heard. To talk more about this is Brian Lilly from the Toronto Sun. Brian, welcome back to our show. It's so great to have you on again today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having mm -hmm. me. Now, Brian, how does one defund the police while demanding that they wear body cameras? Sometimes, you know, that, that's definitely something that costs a lot of money, right? And those are two sort of competing demands being made in Canada from anti-racism protesters across the country, but they don't seem to go together. And, and they really don't go together. And I've been, you know, listening to the questions put to the prime minister, to various premiers, and the idea, you know, depends on who you're talking to, Jeanette. I mean, we've got a couple of different streams of thought. There are some that want a full defunding of the police. Then there are others that are a bit more nuanced and they say, look, uh, police spend a bunch of time responding to mental health calls. And so why don't we take the money that we would spend on that and put it in mental health programs? That's an interesting debate to have. And I think police would be interested in talking about, OK, could we redeploy our resources differently? But the idea that we would completely defund police, that's a non-starter, I think, for most voters across the country, regardless of race or ethnicity. When it comes to how do we deploy resources, that's one that, as I said, even police are willing to have. But you can't defund police and demand that they have body cameras. Now, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called for body cameras for the RCMP um, earlier this week. Shortly after that, shockingly, uh, RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky said, yes, some RCMP officers are going to start wearing them. Now, no, she said some. This is an incredibly expensive proposition to buy the technology, to train people how to wear it properly, to have the ability to record and store. I mean, you work in a television station. You know how much is required to record and store your show every day. And now imagine that for hundreds, if not thousands of police officers within a given department. Yeah, the Toronto Police uh, Service alone is bigger than Canada's standing army. Wow. You know, just to put it in perspective, <laughs> every single one of them is going to be outfitted with body cameras or a portion of them. That's just one department. So it's an incredibly expensive proposition that politicians haven't been willing to put forward. They may uh, decide to go that way shortly, but they're not there yet. But y you're right. You can't defund police and demand body cameras. If we want to have a grown-up conversation, which some are willing to do, but activists on both sides probably not, let the grown-ups talk. Let us figure out how we can improve policing for the whole community. You know, I um, was listening to a, a man named uh, uh, Jamal Giovanni. He is head, the head of Ontario Premier Doug Ford's uh, Council on Equality of Opportunity. And, and he says, look, as a black man, I, you know, I'm going to challenge this idea of defunding the police and pointed out that Ontario's two biggest cities have police chiefs, Mark Saunders in Toronto, Peter Slowly in Ottawa, who are black men and are experts in community policing. So let grown-ups like Jamal have that conversation. Let others have that conversation. But the shrill activists that say, get rid of police, period, uh, you know, we don't need to pay attention to them. Yeah, it sounds like an incredibly expensive and daunting endeavor for sure. Now, Brian, the Prime Minister continues to push the idea that much of the country needs to remain locked down, even though he himself participated in a mass protest last week. So you had the chance to ask him about that. What did he say? Well, he kind of danced around it. And, and look, it's an uncomfortable question because it was just last week that he was saying that you know, the provinces have to be careful. And look, Alberta is in a much better position than Ontario is. He may represent a Quebec riding, Montreal riding specifically, but Justin Trudeau for most of his, a good chunk of his life has lived and worked in Ottawa. 
he lives in Ottawa right now. He ignored the Ontario government's uh, emergency orders. He's ignored Quebec ones in the past. How do you keep the public on side with a lockdown when you keep ignoring them? He danced around that question. When I put it to him that he was taking a knee around the corner from where a, a, a restaurant was being fined for letting their customers uh, eat a slice of pizza that they bought for takeout on their patio, they weren't serving them on the patio, they're just allowing them to eat. Um, he talked about South Korea and contact tracing. Look, his answer was uh, on issues that are very important to the recovery, but they had nothing to do with the question. So I, I think he knows that he talked a bit about trying to find the right balance, but you know, okay, set aside people having pizza. Think about all the, the people across Canada that have lost loved ones mm -hmm. and haven't been able to see them before they died, or haven't been able to go to the funeral. Yeah. And that's, that's really the nub of the issue. We have put our lives on hold, and now suddenly because the right protest movement comes along, we're just going to shove it aside. I, I don't think that is where most people want to be. Yeah, it's completely ironic, isn't it? Now, I believe you also quizzed uh, Doug Ford on Monday, didn't you? Yeah, well, uh, I was able to quiz both uh, the Premier and the, the Prime Minister on the same day. Uh, Doug Ford didn't go to the protest, but he allowed them to go on. And he kind of danced around it. He talked about communities being hurt. He talked about understanding that people were hurting um, by not being able to see their loved ones, uh, but said, look, most people are, are doing the right thing. Neither one of them was comfortable, uh, which, uh, look, I'm fine with. My job is not to make friends with the premier or the prime minister. My job is to, to ask questions. And so many Canadians were looking at what happened, especially uh, in Toronto. Now, thankfully in Toronto and in Ottawa and in just about every other city, they were peaceful protests. That was not the case in Montreal. Uh, as someone that has lived and worked in Montreal, I can tell you that they'll riot because it's Tuesday. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem to matter. Uh, you know, the, the, the Habs win the cup, the Habs don't win the cup. You know, this sort of thing happened. So uh, they rioted, there was looting. Thankfully that didn't happen elsewhere in Canada. Right. And let's, as I said on the last uh, question, let's continue to have a grown up conversation about issues that are very real. Racism is a real issue that happens in much of the country and depending on where you live, it's a different conversation. Let's have that without the looting, without the violence, and let's fix real problems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, when it comes to different regions of the country um, and how we're doing with COVID-19, your research shows that most of the country is doing well, other than Quebec, of course. They just reported today 5,000 deaths, I believe, right? So break down maybe some of the numbers for us. Well, Quebec has uh, about 22.5% of the uh, country's population, but they have had about 60% of all deaths in the country. Their deaths per 100,000 of population, and that's, you know, when you want to compare different jurisdictions, it's unfair to compare Ontario and Alberta, let's say, on real numbers, because we've got a much bigger population. We've got an extra 10 million people compared to you in Alberta. Okay, so how do we do it? Statisticians regularly say per 100,000 of population. When it came to Quebec, they were at 57 last week. It may have gone up since then, but 57 deaths per 100,000. Okay. That puts them at almost double the United States. That puts them above France, above Italy, uh, just below Britain. So these are some of the worst hit countries in Europe. That's the level that they're at. You take Quebec out of the equation, Canada's uh, total deaths per 100,000 dropped from 20 down to 9.3. Uh, to put it in perspective, BC and Alberta, just over three deaths per 100,000. Ontario wow. at 16. Most of the provinces don't even hit one death per 100,000 of population. So that's why you're able to open up. That's why if I was, you know, in Alberta uh, next week, I could go to a movie. You're going to open those things back up. We're not there yet in Ontario. Mm -hmm. So there, there really is a disparity. I will say this. You look at the, the four areas that were hardest hit. Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Montreal, what do they all have in common? International flights coming in. And uh, that was the initial wave. And then it spread in the community from there. International flights doesn't matter whether it's from China, Iran, Egypt, or the United States. Mm -hmm. That's where the flights were coming in from. That's where the cases were coming in from. Right. No, well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned now international flights. So let's talk about the border now. So the closure of the border with the U.S. has created some problems for the many families that straddle that border. 
So the federal government is now clarifying the rules on who can cross and why. So exemptions were made for family reunification at the border. Let's talk about that a little bit. And to a degree, they've always been in place, but I guess not clear enough. And so we saw you know, a case that was highlighted in, in the media a couple of weeks ago yeah. of a man who lived and worked in the United States. His wife was here. She was pregnant. He was going to be coming back and he couldn't be here for the, the birth of, I, I believe it was his son, and a border official said no. There was supposed to be family reunification above and beyond essential trade. Uh, the government has come stepped forward and said, okay, we're, we're going to clarify rules on this. We're going to make it cleaner. And, and I don't think that is necessarily a bad thing. Now, anyone that does come on will have to quarantine for 14 days. That's the sort of border measure, Jeanette, that we should have been doing from the beginning, from the end of January, when I attended the first news conference with medical officials here in Toronto saying, oh, we got our first case of COVID, we should have been looking at quarantine measures from people coming in from hotspots from that date. We didn't until late February. Yeah. We didn't deal with border measures until March. Yeah. And we've been a bit ham-fisted. If there's two areas that I would say that we've, we've fallen down, one is with the federal government, and that's dealing with the border, and the second is in Ontario and Quebec where they did not handle long-term care properly. And that's where the majority of deaths have been. Interesting. Now, Brian, the government shrugged off the idea that they needed to worry about fraudsters on the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. And when you were raising questions about this, the federal government uh, says that they'll take steps to block those who are trying to game the system. That's what they're saying now. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, weeks ago that um, uh, one of my colleagues got a hold of a memo that said uh, civil servants were ringing the alarm bell and saying, hey, look, as many as 200,000 people could be getting this when they're not allowed to have it. Uh, civil servants who are trained in handling issues like EI say, you know what, we want to deal with this. And the government said, no, turn a blind eye, just give this to everyone. They did that. And we, when you're talking 200,000 people getting this that shouldn't, uh, Jeanette, we're talking $400 million a month. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of money. Now they're starting to say that they will crack down. And if you were getting this, you know, not because you thought you were eligible for it and you really weren't, but if you knew you were frauding the system, they're coming after you. They need help from the opposition parties to get that. They dismissed the conservatives before. Now they're going to need the help of the conservatives because the NDP has said, we don't want to go after anyone that got this money when they shouldn't have. You're wrong. Now, Brian, the COVID-19 pandemic has weakened the Canadian economy. And now we're hearing from experts who worry that China will use the economic pain to buy up struggling Canadian companies. Why should we be worried? This is a worry because we're not talking about uh, private sector companies in China coming in and saying, hey, we'd like to partner with you. We've got a lot of money. We'll invest in Canada. What we're talking about are either sovereign wealth funds from China, which is not a democratic state, which has a lot of security implications involved in dealing with them, coming in and buying up strategic industries, natural resources, you know, going back uh, several years, back to the, the Harper government years, they had to deal with the thorny issue of whether to allow uh, a Chinese company called Sinoc to come in and buy an Alberta oil company. Now, this was very controversial at the time. There was pressure from all sides. Uh, there were people in Canada for the merger. There were people in Canada against the merger. And the Harper government said, OK, we're going to allow this one, but going forward, because by the time they got involved, everything was pretty much completed. So they said, going forward, if you're a, a basically a state enterprise coming in to buy, there are going to be reviews. This isn't the old fashioned protectionist. We don't want Americans or Brits or Kiwis coming in and buying up Canadian companies. We want and crave and need foreign direct investment. But there are strings attached when a state enterprise comes in and buys things up. China has massive amounts of money, and because these are companies backed by their government, much like our government can print money to pay for the CERB or wage subsidies or anything else, China can do the same and then buy companies that are in distress due to the, the pandemic who may not be in distress in six months. They can buy them up for pennies on the dollar. 
And so we're being warned by experts this is a problem. This has been raised by the conservatives in the past. So far, the liberal government has been reluctant to do it. In fact, they shut down an attempt by a committee to study it. But thankfully, uh, the, the MPs continue to press on this and more voices are being heard. And I think that the MPs will be studying it now and they're going to go forward and hopefully come up with recommendations that say this is a problem that we need to deal with. And, and look, it, as long as we're talking about countries that are not democratic, that are security concerns, it could be China, it could be Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, to have I'd still have qualms if it was Norway's uh, sovereign wealth fund coming in to buy up our companies um, wholesale. We've got to be careful when it's another government buying up our products. Interesting. Now, Brian, uh, earlier this year, the Liberals suggested regulating what can be posted online. So essentially censor censorship, right? So they quickly walked away from that idea after a public backlash, but now they're suggesting it again, citing that the pandemic as the, as the reason that we need to regulate internet content. Can you explain that? Yeah, back in January, it was a panel that was appointed by the, the Trudeau cabinet. And they said, go forth and study the, the world of online. Go forth and study the future of broadcasting. And they came back and they had a whole bunch of recommendations. And the way that uh, uh, Justin Trudeau's heritage minister, Stephen Guibault, read into them was, well, we need to license news outlets online. Well, I, I work for the Toronto Sun. We don't need a license to print in a newspaper. We don't need a license to publish online. Why would we need one in the future? And they said, oh, well, you know, it'll depend on what type of news agency you are and how big you are. Well, that gets into the government deciding who gets to publish. And that was very problematic. They were denounced on all sides and they quickly said, yes, yeah, sorry, we're not going to do that. Now we've got Mark Gerritsen, who's a, a liberal MP from Kingston, Ontario area. And, and he was standing up in the House of Commons uh, talking to a cabinet minister, Dominic Levant, about this very issue and saying, you know, there's an infodemic of bad information about COVID-19. We need to protect the public from that. Well, my question would be, what bad information? Would, would that be the WHO official this week saying people don't transmit the, the, the virus when they're asymptomatic? Because that's the opposite of what they said the week before and the opposite of what they said three months ago. They've changed their mind several times. By the way, she's since walked that back. Would that be the government that put on their websites and told us all in news conferences, don't wear masks, it's worse than wearing one, and now they require us to wear masks in some situations? Would that be the government that said uh, closing borders won't work? You know, often governments are the biggest source of disinformation out there. And it's people like you and I and another media outlets that look to find the truth and inform the public and sometimes uncover things governments don't like. Allowing the government to decide what will and won't be published is always going to be a bad idea. Well, Brian, it looks like we are out of time, but thank you so much for joining us again today. We always appreciate having you on. Thank you, my pleasure. Marriage is hard at the best of times, and now with the pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic, some might find it even more difficult. Today's guest is a marriage coach and a court-appointed mediator. Ron Price is also the author of Play Nice in Your Sandbox at Home, How to Enjoy Peaceful Relationships with the Important People in Your Life. Welcome, Ron. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Oh, Jeanette, the pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, so Ron, that's an interesting book title. What's the significance of this analogy? Actually, Jeanette, it's the second book in the series, second of three. I, in 2016, I came out with Play Nice in Your Sandbox at Work. And in all of my books, the play is an acronym, a four-step model to prevent trivial, insignificant, meaningless things from blowing up on you and becoming a conflict. And I assume you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. I think we all do. Yeah. Not only were they not a hill to die on, they weren't a hill to get sick on. And yet they're taking over our time, our energy, our lives. So the play is how do you prevent those from happening at work, at home? And again, in November, I'm coming out with at church, which is an interesting, a whole different matter. But how do you prevent conflict? The nice is how do you resolve conflict? Significant differences that Jeanette, we're all gonna have with other people from time to time. How do you resolve those in a productive manner? So, and, and the, in the sandbox, I've just, 
I just never grown up, I guess. People, <laughs> people ask me, where did I grow up? I say, I'm trying to do it in Farmington, New Mexico. So it's, it's just kind of playful and helping people realize conflict can be prevented at times. It can be resolved when yeah. necessary. And like you said, I mean, whether it's at church or home or at work, we're all human, right? And so we have those interactions daily and yeah. it's a challenge, right? Sometimes. Yeah. It's fun though, isn't it? It's fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Ron, you're a court appointed mediator. Can you share what your experience has been with couples who maybe put their kids first above, I guess, their spouse? Yeah, they end up divorced. <laughs> That's, uh, and, and I shouldn't be laughing. That's not funny. But it's incredible how many couples have told me, yeah, we, we put our kids first. We stop focusing on the marriage. Jeanette, if you really want to put your kids first, you, you, you get some very good, reliable sitters or you get other couples with kids your age, the age of your kids and you trade off so that you're going out on regular dates. You're going out and focusing on the marriage because number one, that's what your kids, they want to be able to come home after they've left and grown up. They want to bring their kids to your home to see both grandparents together. So mm -hmm. you want to put the kids first. You want to focus on the kids. You focus on the marriage. Interesting. And I'm sure that that sets a really good example too for the kids in the long run. Oh, absolutely. Point. Now, most people say that finances are the number one reason for divorce, but you say it's something else, that it's failure to cut the apron strings with your own parents. Please explain that. We, we come into a marriage, Jeanette, with certain expectations based largely on how things were in our family of origin. That's all we know, so that's that's how we assume things should be in our new married home. Well, guess what? Your spouse <laughs> didn't grow up in your home. At least, I hope not. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> <laughs> they have a different set of expectations. And so the challenge, one of the challenges in marriage is to carve out not yours or mine, but ours. And you've got to leave mom and dad. You can't you can't be running back to them whenever there's a dust up or a disagreement or whatever. Uh, the smart in-laws, when they see you coming under those circumstances, are going to slam that door in your face and say, you go back and fix it, then come visit us. Uh, <laughs> marriage, you've got to become an us. It's, it's just us. I don't want to say against the world because it's not a negative thing, but no, we're putting a hedge of protection. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. They can give advice if they want. That's fine. But we're making our decisions. We're not doing it our parents' way. We're doing it our way. And if you don't do that, well, you're just setting yourself up for nonstop trouble. Right. That's a good one. Now, the marriage flame tends to dwindle over time, unfortunately. What's your advice for a marriage that might have grown stale? Okay. A actually, Jeanette, can I depress your audience for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> that that flame that you're talking about, that gaga, euphoric, oh, that lasts two years or less. Oh, wow. <laughs> two that years is or depressing. less. Oh. <sighs> Biochemically, it, you cannot sustain that euphoric love. It's supposed to settle in to a more steady, stable, and long-lasting love. And so one of, the, one of the problems that people fall into is they forget the importance of having fun in their relationship. You know, when they first meet, that's, that's all they're doing. They're having fun, they're doing things. And they say, oh, let's do this forever. And, and they marry and, and they still have fun. But over time, and especially when that, again, the gaga wears off, uh, life becomes raising the kids and paying the bills. Or is it, paying the kids and raising the bills, whichever. <laughs> Fun gets pushed to the wayside and that's a huge mistake. In fact, in my play nice model, the P stands for play, play, play. You've heard the expression, the family that prays together stays together. Okay, Sure. that for the theologians. I'm saying the family that plays together has regular date nights just as a couple and fun nights as a family 
is going to experience the joy longer, keep the flame, as you said, burning more brightly. Right. And doesn't it seem that the common courtesies that we extend to strangers sometimes get missed in our own marriage? Where are some of these and why do we neglect them at times? You know, Jeanette, how much time do we have? Do we have about three hours? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but the point is valid. We, we're at a grocery store and somebody puts groceries in our bag, we say thank you. And they typically say you're welcome. We say please to people, that total strangers that we don't know, but we neglect that at home. We, I think we just kind of take people for granted to an extent. And, and when we ask for something, don't, don't just ask, say please. When somebody does something for you, say thank you. When somebody thanks you, say you're welcome. This is not rocket science. This is not earth shaking. But you know what? Those little things, Jeanette, they do add up over time and, and help people want to, to serve more, love more, encourage more. Yeah, remember your, your P's and T's. We, I've heard the expression, mind your P's and Q's. I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't know what the Q's are. <laughs> mind your P's and T's. Your pleases, your thank yous, your welcomes. You'll be glad you did. Yeah, good advice. Now, in your book, you define marriage as two imperfect people who join together to try to form a perfect union. You can, can you explain this? Well, that's what it is. But what's the chances of that, Jeanette? I don't know if you're, you're a betting woman or not. But again, you take two imperfect, hurting individuals who have needs that they're not good at voicing at times. That's a whole nother matter. And they expect the other person to understand and meet those needs nonstop. You're dreaming. You're dreaming. It's not going to happen. Imperfect people cannot create perfect relationships. And especially, as you said in the beginning, under this COVID-19, when we're having more time together, we've got the added stress and the uncertainty and, and perhaps financial challenges. Yeah, imperfect people, that's you're going to see the flaws and the faults and the shortcomings in your mate. So if I may, Jeanette, could I, could I cite the L chapter real quickly? I think it fits well here. Sure. The L chapter is look for the good. Again, it, you ask my wife to list Ron's top 10 faults. It might take her 10 seconds, maybe one second per fault. <laughs> you ask her to write down Ron's top 10 good qualities, his positives. Well, depending on the mood, depending if we're if we're in harmony together, it won't take her very long. If we're if we're not in harmony, it might take her a while to think about the good. So so force yourself. Look for the good. Look for the good and your mate, your children, let them know, you know, I really appreciate this about you. Thank you so much. You're going to start seeing more of it, I promise. Mm -hmm. That's nice advice. Now, we all know the phrase forgive and forget, of course, but you say that that's unrealistic. Why is that? Yeah, yeah. Jeanette, I don't know about Canada, and I'm looking for an opportunity to say the word oot, because I love the way you folks say oot. I, in, in Canada, when you were young, did you hear an expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Do you remember what age you found out that was a total lie? <laughs> words. <laughs> Pretty young. <laughs> yeah. Words can be very hurtful. Well, another expression we've learned from way back is forgive and forget. Jeanette, we can't do it. Now, you're young enough. This won't be a challenge for you. But I ask people my age to think back to their first or second grade teacher. Let me put you on the spot. Can you can you recall the name of your first or second grade teacher? Yeah, I can actually. When's the last yeah. time you thought of that person? Um, it's been a little while. Um, yeah, thanks. But, but, yeah. <laughs> but look how quickly, look how quickly you were able to access mm -hmm. that information. Yeah. Our brains are such, God made our brains in such a way we don't forget anything. We, we may not be able to recall it when we want to. That's a, I promise you that one. But every, every memory, everything that's ever happened to us is in the emotional part of our brain. And something can trigger a memory to bring it right back to the surface with all the power and the pain and the impact. So to say forgive and forget, I might as well say forgive and eat this building. It's, it's not going to happen. The, the trick, if you will, the challenge, 
is forgive and move on. Purposely decide, you know what? No, nope, I have forgiven that. And if I have thoughts come into my mind, I'm, I'm deleting them because right. I have chosen to forgive. And yeah, move on. it's an action, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a decision and an action. Yes, mm -hmm. well put. So uh, most of us who are married are either trying or have tried to change our spouse, but you say that this is a waste of energy. Well, I, I, Jeanette, I, did, I didn't ask you, but are you married, Jeanette? I am, yes. Ever tried to change your spouse? <laughs> I think everybody's <laughs> you have, guilty of it a little bit, yeah, right? I, I was going to say, you don't, you don't have to answer that. I was, I was watching the Today Show. This is probably last century, last millennium. It was a long time ago. And I was just about to shuttle off and go back to work. And they said, in our next segment, an animal trainer is going to come on and explain how she used animal training techniques to change her husband. And I said, oh, this is going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I stayed and I watched it. And I can't remember her name. I would give credit if I could. But she said, you know, when we train animals, we look for those behaviors that we like, those behaviors that we want to see more of, and we reward them. We give them food or compliments, praise, what have you. We let them know, yeah, that's good. We see more of it. She said, I started doing that with my husband. She said, when I saw him doing something that I appreciated, I let him know in no uncertain terms. Wow, thank you. That's, man, I like that. Not over the top, come on, but but realistic, I appreciate that. And she said, you know what? And he began to change. But then Jeanette, she looked right in the camera and she said, oh, was it I who had changed? Probably. And Jeanette, I did, a dance. <laughs> I did a dance in my office. It was her, she changed. Because when, you, when your mate knows you're trying to change them, the walls of the fence are gonna go right up. You know that, we all know that. So when you stop trying to change and you look for the good and, and let them know you appreciate it, they'll change on their own, which is far, far better than coercive change. You mentioned an acronym HALT, H-A-L-T. Uh, maybe tell us about that. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's universal that we are not always at our best. We like to think we are, but we're not. So if you're hungry, and trust me, you're, you're not going to be in total control of your emotions, your thoughts, whatever, because you're, you're, your emphasis is on your appetite at the moment, your stomach. If you're angry, ooh, you're not at your best. You, you have left your thinking brain, you're in your emotional brain. You got to be careful. If you're feeling lonely or maybe your needs aren't being met, if you're tired, so hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that's a bad, I don't say a bad state to be in. We, we get there from time to time, but it's a horrible state in which to try to communicate with another human being, especially your spouse. Because if you're, again, if you're under that condition, you're tense, you're irritable, you'll take things the wrong way. That's when you need to know the secret of calling a timeout the correct way. Jeanette, did you know there's a, a right way to call a timeout and a wrong way to call a timeout? I'm sure there is, but I, I don't know the secret ingredient there. Well, may I share it with your audience? Sure. Thank you. I was hoping you'd say yes. <laughs> of course. We, we have a part of our brain that thinks right in the front, the frontal lobe. It's the command center of the brain, if you will. Our thoughts, reason, logic come from that part of the brain. We also have the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain. And what can happen to us as human beings, Jeanette, is we can get so upset about something, so agitated, so irritated, we will leave the thinking part of our brain, get smack dab in that emotional brain, and uh, when that happens, all bets are off. So at that time, you have to call a timeout. You have to announce to the other person, you know, right now, I can't do it. I'm too upset. If we, if we try to talk now, I'm going to say something or do something. I don't say or do. Time out. But Jeanette, here's the key. You've got to announce the time in. In other words, if I say to my wife, time out, and I storm out, I've made it worse, not better. Because I've left her one. Well, is he coming back? Is he rejecting me? Is he rejecting marriage? She doesn't know. 
So I need to say one of two things. I need to say, I need a timeout, or I think we need a timeout. How about if we get back together in a half an hour, pick this up at two o'clock, let's talk about this after dinner. So I'm letting her know I'm rejecting the argument. I'm not rejecting her. That's right. Or the marriage. And, and two, two real keys, by the way, I can say, I need a timeout, or I think I need a timeout. God forbid I ever tell my wife, I think you need a timeout. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's not going to go I, over I, so well. <laughs> yeah, no, that won't go over well. Yeah, no, that is really fantastic advice. Probably something that we can all use, whether we're married or not. Yeah, no, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jeanette. If I may, when I wrote Play Nice in Your Sandbox at Work, people think, well, I'm, I don't work, so I don't need that. A hundred percent. 100% of the skills that I teach in the at work book are applicable. Probably 80% of the at home book are applicable at work. And you know, probably 50 or 60% of the at church book, their relationship skills, they're gonna be applicable at home and at work. Because like I think you said it earlier, relationships are relationships. We gotta learn how to get along. Exactly. Ron, thank you so very much for joining us today. We really enjoyed having you on our show. Jeanette, I'm just sorry it's come to an end. I've enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> thank you so much. Ron Price is the author of Play Nice in Your Sandbox at Home. From all of us here at BCN, thank you for watching.